Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer. And let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're very grateful we get to come into your house openly, freely. Lord, we know there's places all over the earth where we would be persecuted, guns shoved in our faces, Lord. But God, we're grateful that you gave us the privilege of being in a place, God, where we can lift our hands, where we can worship and sing and praise and clap and shout, jump and dance in your presence, God, freely and openly. And so, God, we do just thank you, Father God, for that privilege, for that honor. Tonight, God, as we come into your house and open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us, open us up to receive it. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives, God. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, God. Speak clearly. Oh, God, we just thank you that you send your Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, even the instruction and the correction that we need for our lives, God. From your word, Lord, we thank you for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your kingdom, building your house, God. And so we thank you, Father God, that you bless all of our brothers and sisters. Bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for the assemblies, God, the Foursquare denomination. God, for Calvary Chapel and Harvest, for Oak Valley, God, for the well and the way, for Ecclesia, for Emmanuel Baptist Trinity, God. Thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, the Sabbatarians, God, all the wonderful churches that are out there with such diversity in the body of Christ, Lord. How wise you are, you knew different people would need a different style, God. And so we thank you, Father God, for the diversity and yet unity in the body of Christ. We bless them, Lord, as you bless us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Tonight I want to talk to you about a subject called God, Our Strength. As you're thinking about that, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 27. We'll start out in 1 Samuel, chapter 27, then we'll head over to 1 Samuel, chapter number 30. I'm going to take a story out of the Bible about a man by the name of David. You know him as King David, mightiest king, greatest king Israel ever knew. Now this was a time where King Saul, David's predecessor, was still on the throne. He still had the authority in Israel. He was still king. And so David was being pursued by Saul. Saul was trying to kill David. He had already tried to pin him to the wall. He already had gotten mad and sent him away. And, and uh, you know, he even, even had outbursts at a dinner table conversation one night with his son and shamed his son. Lots of different stuff happened. And so Saul intended to kill David. In fact, Saul was tracking David through the wilderness with thousands of soldiers. So David is running from Saul two times. It's recorded in the Bible that David comes up on Saul and could have killed him very easily. Had him and decided not to touch the Lord's anointed. And so what does he do? He reveals it to Saul later. Hey, Saul, I had you. Man, I, I could have taken you out and I chose not to. And so Saul repents and he says, you're more righteous than I am. Indeed, you're, you're going to be the king. And so Saul says, I'm, I'm not going to mess with you anymore. This is where we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 27. Take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 27. In the first verse, look at what it says. It says, and David said in his heart. Everybody say said in his heart. heart. See, this is dangerous thinking at times because sometimes we can talk to ourselves. I like how the New Testament says that they reasoned within themselves. Here's the reason why I say that's dangerous. Because the Bible records in the book of Proverbs that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And that even though we may cast lots, we can do all sorts of calculations, we can do all sorts of things to try and find out the will and the way of God, that the answer comes from the Lord. So here David says something in his heart, but he doesn't consult the Lord about it. And look at what it says. He says, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. See, he starts to get afraid. He starts to allow fear in, doubt and unbelief. Even though God says you're going to be king, he thinks, well, I'm not going to be king if Saul comes in and steps in and kills me. Starts reasoning within himself. Look at what he says, there's nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. So now all of a sudden he's going to the enemy's camp. Instead of staying within the borders of Israel, the promised land, the land that God had given to the children of Israel. And even though God had sustained David's life 
Now, two times he's been able to show Saul, hey, look it, I could have killed you. And yet, decided not to. He escaped out of Saul's hands so many times, he decides he's going to run into the enemy's camp. He says, I'll speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me anymore in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hands. See, he knew that Saul wouldn't pursue him into the land of the Philistines. In fact, if you read the next verse, they go and they report it to Saul, and Saul stops following him. David's plan worked, in other words. Hard part about that, hard part about that is that God will often allow us the desire of our heart, even though it may be contrary to his will if we're set on it. Why? Because God gives us a free will choice. Why? Because God knows our path and knows what's ahead of us. Why? Because God works all things together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. See, even though David may have made the wrong decision here, God still used it to do something in David's life. So here David is living in the land of the Philistines. He's in with the king, right? And uh, so he asked the king, he says, king, I need some land. I need, you know, you, you guys don't want us here living in the city. Put us somewhere else. So he gives them their own little town. So they've got this place called Ziklag, okay? And so David and his men, there's about 600 of them total that go down to Ziklag. And they're from Ziklag. They'll head out and they'll raid different places. And as they raid, they don't leave man, woman, or child alive so that it can't get back to the king there uh, of the Philistines that David's going out raiding other people and taking people out. So David thinks he's cool. He thinks he's got it together. He's prospering. He's doing his thing. And finally, it comes time for the Philistines to go out to war against Israel. David and his soldiers mount up. Now, I, I don't know. To me, this is probably David's low point in life. I know that there were other points, you know, the whole issue with Bathsheba and Uriah as king. Yeah, that was a low point uh, when he numbered Israel and it caused the death of tens of thousands of people. Yeah, that was a low point. But when I take a look at a man saddling up to go fight against his own people, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be crazy. You are now opposed to the army of the living God. And where was that whole, I shall not touch the Lord's anointed thing? What happened to that, David? Now you're mounting up to go fight. Now, who knows? Maybe in the midst of battle, maybe if he would have been able to go out, he would have seen the slaughter of his people and turned on the enemy and, and, and God would have delivered him. I don't know. The Bible doesn't record that. What the Bible does record is that the Philistine princes say, um, excuse me, David and his men are mounting up? Uh-uh, no. They are not going to war with us. Send him away. So David says, what have I done? Why can't I go out with you guys? And, and, the, and the king says, no, you can't go with us. The princes won't have it. Head on back to Ziklag. So he goes back. This is where we pick up the story. 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter number 30. Everybody okay so far? Okay, praise the Lord. We're going somewhere tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 30, starting in verse number 1. We're going to read through verse number 4. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire. Verse number two, And had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. Now, David had gone out and raided in the territory of the Amalekites. Didn't leave man, woman, or child alive. Amalekites now, David is now reaping what he has sown. Amalekites now come back, but thank God he's gracious. Even in our mistakes, even in our wanderings, God is still taking care of David and his men, and not a single man, woman, or child is killed. They are all kept alive, just their town is burned. Not a big deal, they can rebuild. But the people and the goods are all kept intact. Verse number three, so David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Verse four, then David and the people who were with him. Now, these are soldiers. There are 600 trained mighty men of war that had gone out raiding with David. Look at what happens to these big, strong, brave heart type men. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Everybody say no more power. No more power. That means that they sobbed and they sobbed and they sobbed and they sobbed until they could sob no more. In other words, they were sitting there just <laughs> No more strength. Couldn't do it anymore. Verse number five, it talks about David's 
Two wives were taken as well. Verse number six, now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. So David's got a problem. David's got an issue. People he's leading are now wanting to kill him. They're whispering to one another, hey, you know what? David got us in this mess right now to get into Israel. Hey, listen, if we would have been doing something foolish like that, we could have been here to defend our wives and our children. You know what? We need to kill that guy. He's gotten us into enough trouble. You know, he could have taken out Saul. We could be home right now. He could be king. This could be all done. Let's get some stones. Come on, boys. Gather up, right? So they start talking about stoning him. But look at what David does. Look at what David does. It says, then David strengthened himself where? In the Lord his God. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. See, tonight we're talking about God, our strength. And maybe you've been in situations in life, I know I have, where you have wept and wept and wept and wept because of the situation that was facing you until you had no more strength to weep. Anybody other than Pastor Dan ever been there? See, why? Because sometimes our choices take us there. Sometimes we don't do the right things. Sometimes the devil comes in and steals, kills, and destroys like a raiding band of people who's come against you. And sometimes, can I say this to you? Life happens. We live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. Sometimes it's not your choice. Sometimes it's someone else's choice. Then now you're having to clean up behind them. Whatever the case is, Whatever the situation is, I've got good news for you tonight. We didn't come here together to weep until we have no more strength to weep. We came together tonight to get strengthened in the Lord. See, that's what church is all about. Maybe you didn't realize it, but while you were lifting your hands to the Lord, you were getting a download of power on the inside of you. See, there's, there's this thing called proximity, and the closer you get to God, and the more you get of his power, it's like radiation. The more it affects you, the more it gets down on the inside of you, the more it changes you, the more it rearranges you. See, you can get into the presence of God thinking that you're cool and you got it all together, and God will mess you all up. Or maybe you came in tonight as a mess, and God is saying, I'm going to take your mess, and I'm going to make it your message. I'm going to take the test that you're facing and make it your testimony. See, God is a God who changes things. See, when God comes on the scene, when God does something, if you can strengthen yourself in the Lord, doesn't matter what's outside, doesn't matter the foe, the villain, the problem, the trial, the pressure, the lack, the need, whatever it is, you can handle it. You can handle it. How do I know that? Because look at what David did. Look at what David did. Verse number seven. And then David said to Abithar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abithar brought the ephod to David. See, the ephod was the garment that the priest wore. And they would often bring that close so that they could pray and inquire of the Lord, and the Lord would answer them. Look at what it says, verse 8. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, capital A, this is God speaking to David now. And he answered him, Pursue. Pursue. For you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So God gives David a word at this point. If there was ever a moment that David needed a word, it was right now. His two wives were gone. He was in the land of the enemy. And his men were speaking of stoning him. If ever David needed direction from God, it was at this moment. And now here he is facing this time, facing this pressure, facing this trial. And God speaks to him and gives him a word. See, each and every one of us every day, we're facing stuff. And if ever we needed God, it is right now, right here in this situation. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. I got to get all that I can of God. I got to get it right now. God, I need a word. God, I need your word. God, I need a verse. God, I need some power. God, I need some strength. Why? Because should tomorrow come, should the sun rise, Lord? You've got a covenant with the sun. It will rise each and every morning if Jesus doesn't come. When and if it does, God, I need you. need your strength. I want to go out there in my ability. I can mess things up pretty good. But God, in your strength, I can do it. I can handle it, God. Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Everybody say recover all. 
See, that's a very important statement, recover all, because, see, there was a lot that was at stake. There was a lot that was lost, a lot that was stolen, a lot that was taken away. 1 Samuel chapter 30, drop down to verse number 17. See, so David gathers up the men they pursue. There's 200 men out of the 600 that say, David, we can't go any further. We cried too much back there, and now we don't have any strength left over. David says, fine, you guys stay here, stay with the supplies. Me and the guys that can still go will go. They go on, they find an Egyptian slave, and they, they strengthen him, they feed him. He says, I just came from the Amalekites. They said, will you show us where they are at? He says, sure, I will if you don't kill me or don't give me back to my master yeah that's fine I'll show you so they take them down what do they find they find them having a party they find the enemy just dancing and laughing and having a good old time with their stuff and their wives and children in the camp with them all tied up look at what they do first Samuel chapter 30 verse number 17 says this then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day did you just notice the time frame it was twilight. Sun's going down. He attacks them from the going down of the sun till the evening of the next day. That means for 24 hours, a man who had no strength in him was fighting a battle and defeating his enemies. That has to be a supernatural strength that came upon David and these 400 men who were with him. Look at this, not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So a bunch of chickens ran off on the backs of some camels. But I want you to notice the guys that got away were the same number as the guys who were fighting. That means that they were way, way, way outnumbered. And even though they were way, way, way outnumbered, they fought from night till night, 24 hours of fighting, and they just whipped them. They just took them out. My goodness. My goodness. Now look at this. Verse number 18. So David recovered some of his stuff. He recovered half. Just the people. Just the people and a, a few sheep. You guys aren't playing with me tonight. You've got to play. If you're going to sit in church, you've got you to play, okay? David recovered what? All. all. What does all mean? All, all means all. That's right. All means all. See, what did the Lord tell him he would recover? All. all. See, sometimes we get so focused on the problem, the pressure, the trial. Sometimes we get so focused on God, I lost this. That God says, pursue, you will overtake them, and you will recover all. And we're still focused over here. God says, quit your bawling and swallowing, your belly aching. Get up. Let's go. Let's take out the enemy. I'll give you the strength. I'll give you the support. I'll give you the supply. Come on. Let's do this. Wow. So he recovered all. Verse 18 goes on to say that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. Verse 19, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything, which they had taken from them. And just in case you didn't get it the first time, the word repeats itself. David recovered what? All. Oh, that's right. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Some of you guys came in here tonight broke, busted, disgusted. Came in here a mess. It's okay. Like I said before, God's going to turn that around to be a message. Some of you guys are facing a fiery trial or a test. God says, I'm going to make that your testimony. But if you want the strength of God, there got to be some things that happen. It doesn't just happen because you sat in a church service. Some things have to happen in your life if you want the strength of God. And I believe there's a couple of things we're going to learn tonight from this story that we just read about David. That we can find ourselves in this passage. We can say, you know what? Yeah, that's about David, but God is showing me an example. And it's about my life here and now today. You want the strength of God? Anybody in this place want the strength of God? Okay. Here's what you're going to have to do. Number one, you're going to have to find your strength in God. You see what I did? You want the strength of God, you've got to find it in God. Don't go look into the energy drink aisle to find your strength. Don't go look into a pill. Don't look to your neighbor. Don't look to that good-looking thing across the room. There is no strength there. 
in, in, in fact, if you, if you start talking to Samson a little bit, you'll find out there might be some weakness there. Hello? You want the strength of God, don't go look in any other place except God. Where did David strengthen himself? And the Lord his God, right? David didn't strengthen himself in eating and drinking and partying. Didn't strengthen himself in his friends. Listen, his friends wanted to kill him at the time. What did David do? David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. How did he do that? Think about it. He's sitting there probably in an ash heap where his house used to be. Probably sitting where his bed used to be. Probably sitting in a place where, you know, his wives and his children were having a, a, a good meal or something like that, just crying. And he hears the whispers outside, let's kill him. So what does he do? He decides to strengthen himself in the Lord his God. How does he do that? Well, it had to be prayer. It had to be worship. Maybe he sang a song that he had written out there on the hills of Judea while he was tending the sheep as a child that always encouraged him. Maybe, maybe he sang the song he was singing when, when the lion came against the sheep. Maybe he sang the song he was singing when the bear came out. See, David had a pool and a place where he could go. He had a resource that he says, I'm going to strengthen myself and I know where to go. I know where the power is. See, church, if you're feeling weak in this place and you don't know how to get to the strength of God, it's time to get in proximity. It's time to get close to God. The Bible says draw near to God and God will draw near to you. So you got to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. That means that when you're going through a hard time or if you're messed up or, or, or if you're, you're out of luck or out of time or out of resource or whatever it is, that's not time to run from church. That's time to run to church. Say, but pastor, I feel guilty. I feel wrong. I feel dirty. Listen, God will forgive you. God will clean you. You just got to bring it to him. You gotta repent of that wickedness. Yeah, God's gonna ask you to clean some stuff up yourself too. But listen, God is right here welcoming you. Take a thousand steps away from God, but it only takes one step to get back to Him. Why? Because when you start drawing near to God, God will start drawing near to you. And how many of you know God's got bigger legs and feet than we do? Hello. Find your strength in God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. I love this. Ephesians, turn with me to the New Testament. Some great verses in the New Testament talking about the strength of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Normally when we go to Ephesians 6, we're talking about the armor of God. But look at what it says right before it starts talking about the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Look at this. Finally, my brethren, be strong where? In the Lord and in the power of his might. See, that tells me I don't need to be strong in my own might. I don't have to have it all together. I don't have to have the education. I don't have to be the know-it-all. I don't have to be the, the most resourced. I don't have to have the most money. I don't have to have the big job or the big fancy car or the big house or anything. I don't have to have any of that stuff. All I've got to be is me. Why? Because if I come and I'm me and I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, God can be nothing other than Himself, right? And by God's nature, God is mighty, God is strong, God is amazing, God is powerful, God is a God who has ultimate, unlimited resources, God is a God of wisdom, God is a God of understanding, and therefore, I don't have to have it all together, all I got to have is Him. Wow, isn't that amazing? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. See, the Apostle Paul said, when I am weak, then he is strong. See, in our culture and in our society, we so look down on weakness. It's discriminated against. It's put down. It's declassified. I mean, it's just lowered and lowered and lowered. And if you're weak, if you don't have it all together, if you don't have a, a, a five-fold plan or, or a hundred-year plan or, you know, if you don't have whatever, then, then you're not going to make it. You're just done and, and you're, you're, you're just wrong and you might be a little ugly too. See, that's how the world looks at us. Look at Christians saying, you guys are crazy. And yet we say, no, we're not crazy. We're confident in who our God is. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. See, sometimes we've got to let go of our might. 
And we got to take hold of his mind. Stop trying to find your strength in yourself, in your wisdom, in your education, in your money, in your job, in your husband or wife, in your friends, in your relationships, in your status, in any of that stuff. And let's start finding our strength in God. Can you say amen? amen. I've got a note. Uh, I'll share it with you. Guy, a Christian brother, he's in prison, wrote me a note. Pastor Dan Roth, I'm still here, okay? So he's still in jail. And he says, and I received your letter along with the books you sent. So I, I, he had asked me if I could send him some stuff, so I did. Thank you so much. Listen to what he says. I have remained strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Every day I read my Bible, pray several times throughout the day, and fellowship. And he says, I feel so full of the Spirit. And then he goes on and he says, uh, this is the P.S. He, he said some other stuff. But he says, P.S., every time I read a daily devotional from the books you sent me, it's like it talks to me. It makes me say, wow. Then I look up the scriptures in my Bible. I have to keep my lamp lit with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Thanks. Isn't that amazing? Now, can I tell you something? This guy's in jail. And he's talking like that. Why is he talking like that? Because he's keeping himself strong, where? In the Lord and in the power of his might. Doesn't matter the circumstances that are surrounding him. Doesn't matter the literal jail cell that's surrounding him. Doesn't matter the constraints that are literally put on him every day. He is strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's happy. He's fulfilled. He's got a relationship with God. He's going to be out soon and back in this church. He's going to be a great man of God and do great things. Why? Because he's not getting off God. Don't let your circumstances get you off God. Get closer to God and find your strength in him. Hallelujah. I'm preaching myself happy here. God is good. Second thing. Second thing. If you want the strength of God, what do you need? Well, here's the second thing. Work with God's strength in obedience. Work with God's strength in obedience. Look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse number 8. Let's put it up on the overheads just to remind ourselves. You can stay there in the New Testament. Look at it. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. Did you catch it? See, David had a promise. Promise was, you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. But in order to recover all, he first had to pursue. See, he had to work with the power of God. He had to get going. He had to get started. He had to do something in order to meet up. See, when God finds you on the road of obedience, God will meet you with his power. See, and maybe, maybe you heard the old phrase where God guides, he provides, Right? See, if you're walking in obedience and you know this is the path that God has said to, for you to walk down, on that path is where you will find the power. Children of Israel are coming into the land of Egypt. I'm sorry, coming into the, land, the promised land, out of Egypt. And here they are, and the Lord says, I want the priests to go get in the water. And as they get in the water, the Jordan River will pile up, and it will part just like the Red Sea parted before you. So here come the priests, and they got the Ark of the Covenant, and they're walking into the river, and nothing's happening until they actually step in the water. And as they get wet, what happens? The waters part. See, it was on their way of obedience that God met them with the power, and the miraculous happened. See, sometimes we're afraid to step out in faith. We got a word from God, and we're saying, God, I, I hear you. You're saying that I, I, I'm going to overtake. I, I, I'm going to recover all, but God, I'm scared. God, I don't, I don't want to. God, I don't have the strength right now. But God says, all you got to do is, see, here's Peter. He's on the boat. Lord, if that's you, command me to come. Jesus says, come. Now, if Peter would have said, okay, and did nothing, Nothing would have happened, right? What did Peter have to do? Peter had to step out of the boat. And he had to, and listen, if you've ever been on a boat, you know you don't just like what I did right here. It wasn't like he had the, the little landing on our, our modern day boats that we have, you know, where you just kind of like, okay, you know. It wasn't like that. 
They had a limp. They had a rim. This was a fisherman's boat. And so to get out of that boat actually took him crawling and climbing over the side of that boat. He had to get out of that boat and he had to jump out in order to fulfill the word of the Lord. But as he did, what happened? God met him with his power. Peter's the only other man that we know of, according to the Bible, that walked on water. Are you listening tonight? Come on. You're there in Ephesians, turn to me the book of Colossians. Past the book of Philippians, you'll find the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Last verse in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 29. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 21, he's 29. He's talking about preaching the gospel, presenting every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Verse 29 starts out, he says, To this end, I also labor. Notice Paul is doing something. What's he doing? Laboring. What's laboring? Work, right? Not just work. If you labor at something, that's hard work. I think it was Thomas Edison that said a lot of people miss opportunities because they're dressed in overalls and look like work. <laughs> to this end, I also labor. Look at the next word. Striving. So he's laboring, he's striving. That means he's putting it all in. He's going 100%. He's leaving nothing behind. He's using every ounce of himself, all of his strength, and he's laboring, striving according to. What does that mean? In the likeness of or in the similitude of, in the same manner as something else, according to his working, which works in me mightily. So Paul says, I know that there's something going on on the inside of me. I know that God is doing a work inside of me. And he says, so in the same manner that God is working in me, I'm working hard so that God can work through me. See, if you came in here tonight and you said, I want the strength of God, but you weren't ready to get to work doing something, you're not going to get it. God says, I need you to not only believe me, but I need you to trust me and step out in faith because faith without works is dead. Therefore, get to work on what it is that you've heard from me, and I will give you the grace, I will give you the strength, I will give you the power that you need to accomplish what I've called you to do. Now, these are some interesting words up here. To this end, I also labor striving according to his working. His working is the word energeo. It's the word that we, where we get our English word energy from. So he says, I also labor striving according to his energy, which he says, which works energeo in me mightily dynamis, which is the word that we get for dynamite. In other words, he says that the energy of God on the inside of us, when we work together it, with it, has explosive potential. It's got the power to just blow your situation up. Maybe you felt like you were coming against a wall. As you get in line with the Spirit of God, you start working with God and not against God, and you, and you start to put yourself in that position. Bang, things happen. Things start to blow up. Things start to move. Things, walls start crumbling down, and God does a great and mighty, wonderful work. Are you listening today? So neat. As I was studying for this part of the message... I get a little on my door. Now, when we're studying, we put a little note on the door that says, please do not disturb. And everybody in the office knows, please do not disturb. And yet, so I roll my eyes a little bit. And I say, come in. And I get, Pastor Dan, I know you're busy, but... I'm so sorry, but I know you're studying, but I, 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 just, I just had to tell you. And I said, what is it? See, if, if there's going to be a little, when I'm studying, it better either be really bad or really good. <laughs> now, the assistant that was coming in said, oh, it's really good news. I said, all right, come on in. Come on in. Tell me about what it is. Because, see, if it's just average bad or average good, I don't want to hear about it. I can wait. Okay. <laughs> So it's really good. I said, what is it? They said, well, you know, we were, we're, we're going to do an Easter egg hunt in case uh, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. During the Easter season, we're going to do an outreach where you guys can bring friends and people who wouldn't normally come to a church, and, and we'll have an Easter egg hunt for the kids. See, sometimes the lure that you need to, to get the fish in is, is a little something that the world likes. So that's, that's why we do stuff, you know, where we do outreaches. 
And so we're going to do a little Easter egg hunt out there in the courtyard. In fact, it's going to be a big Easter egg hunt. You can invite your friends and that sort of a thing too. And, and they'll bring their kids. Why? For the candy, for the Easter egg hunt. And then, then we got them here on campus and they go, wow, this is a beautiful place. And you say, yes, it is. You should come to church with me tomorrow morning. 8, 10, and 12. It's going to be awesome. You're going to love it. In fact, we've got a sunrise service too. 6 a.m. if you want to come early. See, and now what? You got them. Right, because they say, oh, well, uh, 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 well, I can't, I, uh, you know, well, what are you doing tomorrow? You're doing nothing. Come on, you're coming to church with me. Right, well, you can come for the candy, but you can't come for church. Lump some guilt on, you know, just spread it all out there. There you go. Okay. So anyways, we're, we decide we're going to do this Easter egg hunt outreach. And then we start thinking about it because you've got you to plan stuff out. You can't just throw stuff together and throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. That doesn't work. So especially when you're dealing with thousands of people like we do. And so we say, well, we're going to have to have thousands of eggs. We're going to have to have volunteer stuff in the eggs. We're going to have to, you know, figure this whole thing out. And so we're, we're kind of scratching our heads. Okay, well, how much is that going to cost? What are the resources? How much time on the volunteers? How much time on the staff? What are we doing? All this kind of... So we're calculating it out, right? So, again, good news. What's the good news? 4,000 pre-packed jelly beans in plastic Easter eggs were donated to our food distribution center. Now, how does this relate to this message? I have no idea. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Here's how it relates. Here's how. We knew we wanted to do something for God. We knew that God said, yeah, go for it. Reach out, right? We have permission from the word to reach out. As we're on our way of obedience, how much is it going to take? What are we going to have to do? God meets us with his power and says, here's the resources that you have need of. You see? You see? That's what God does. Sometimes you don't know how you're going to make it. So you start in that direction. All of a sudden, somebody shows up with a check. Sometimes you're wondering how you're going to feed your family. Knock at the door and just a bag of groceries left. See, I've heard story after story after story of people who, when they decided to follow Jesus, first time, uh, Pastor, I decided to, to tithe. First time, I didn't know how I was going to make it, and yet all my bills were paid. Food was on the table, clothes on our backs, shoes on my kids' feet, and, and somebody donated something, car or something. You know, story after story after story. God will find you with his way of strength while you're on your way of obedience. Last one for tonight. You guys got time for one more? I think you do. Here's the last one, number three. You want the strength of God? Here's what you got to do. You got to be generous with God's strength. You got to be generous with God's strength. Now, I'm not talking about money right now, okay? I'm talking about whatever strength God gives you. You need to use that strength to bring others along. You got to use that strength. Now, that may involve money. Don't rule that out and say, God, Pastor Dan said, don't touch my pocketbook. Because I'm not saying that. God may ask for that. Okay, especially if your heart's bound up in it because God's looking for your heart. But what am I saying? See, the people who were David, the Bible says were those in three areas. Distress, people who were in debt, and people who were discontent. Wow. These were the guys. These were the 600 mighty warriors. Distressed, in debt and discontent. The misfits, the messes, the outcasts, these are the ones that God sent to David. Remember, David came out of a rich family. Lots of brothers, lots of prestige, Bethlehem, shepherds and flocks, right? Brothers are going out to war with the king. David is selected to be the king's personal guy, strumming the heart for him, right? Pretty boy out there. He's the next king. And God says, okay, you want to be king? Here's your assignment. Here's a bunch of misfits that are in distress, that are in debt, and that are discontent. David, if you can lead those guys, you can lead Israel. And we read that it was David who strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Not the men. The men wanted to kill David. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. It was David who asked for the ephod and got the direction for the Lord. The Bible records David attacked, David recovered, even though there were 600 men, 400 of them, who went and fought the actual battle. 
Even though the Bible records all this about David, all of them recovered, all of their wives, all of their children, all of their goods, all of their animals, all of their stuff. Why? Because they were associated with David. Let me ask you something. When you get blessed, do the people around you get blessed too? See, because God does not want us to be a closed off people where it's the blessing club and I'm blessed, but nobody else gets blessed. No, God says, I want to bless you. Why? So that you can be a blessing. I want to bless you. Why? Because I want you to overflow. And to pour. how many of you know when your cup runneth over, the table gets blessed? Come on, somebody. When your cup runneth over, the saucer gets filled up. See, if God is pouring into you, you should be like a funnel, open to everything that God has on the top, and then now funneling down into the people around you here on the earth. God wants to give you blessings in life, whether they be blessings of joy, blessings of peace, blessings of finances, blessings of land, blessings of provision, blessing in prosperity, blessing in wisdom, blessing in understanding. See, all those blessings that come to our life, that's a wealth in our life. That is a richness in our life. That is a fatness in our life that now we can say, you know what? I got plenty, bro. How about you get some too? Hey, sis, come over here. I, I got something for you. Hey, you know what? I'm so blessed. I, I just want to give it away. And I as you give it away, as you shovel it out, God shovels it in, and God has a bigger shovel. How amazing is it that God takes people who have no strength, who are weak, to give strength and grace to others? If you feel empty, that's okay. Be empty. Why? Because now you can be a channel for God to pour blessings into other people. God will give you the strength. God will give you the power. God will give you his grace. God will abundantly supply and bless you. Why? So that you can be a channel to funnel that into people in your realm of influence. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 in the New Living Translation. I'll just put it up on the overhead for you. Look at this. Speaking of Jesus, it says he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Isn't that amazing? God wants us as the body of Christ to fitly join together, the Bible says. And it says that as we do our part, each and every one of us, that we give strength and that we give energy and that we give grace and we supply one another's needs. And now we all lift each other up. If you read in the book of Acts, you'll find that, that they didn't withhold any good thing from one another, that they shared in all things, breaking bread together from house to house. Now, I know we all come from a diversity. Some of you guys come from as far as Fontana, even past that. And some of you guys come from as far as Calamasa, even past that. So it would be difficult for us to say, okay, we're going to meet at this person's house at this time and break bread. You know, you, you send a thousand people to my house, we're going to be turning people away at the door after the first, like, 20. You know what I'm saying? So that can't work. So what do we do? We come together and we love one another. We encourage one another. We share where we can. We, 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 we bless each other, you know, however we can. Whatever it is that we can do. I love what the Amplified Bible says. It says, with power adapted to its need. Isn't that just like God? with power adapted to its need. That means some of you came in tonight and you have need of healing. God has power that can adapt to that need. Some of you guys have need of provision. God has power that can adapt to that need. Some of you guys have need of a word from God. You need direction. You need vision. You're lost, wondering what to do. See, God has power that can adapt to that specific need. And as we come together as the body of Christ, now, as we get into the presence of God, the power of God is here in his house. And God says, I've got power for your need. This power can adapt to whatever it is, the need that you have. See, and as God pours out his power and strength on us, we adapt and in turn supply power to one another. Why? Because we strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God. Did you guys get something out of the word tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's do this. If you're in need, maybe you're feeling weak in this place, I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable. Because I know how tough it is to say, I feel weak. Or I don't have any strength. Because we want to feel like we have it all together. But listen, you're in the presence of brothers and sisters tonight in the Lord. People that love you. People who at one time or another have felt the same way. 
And the Bible says that we should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So if you say, Pastor, I feel weak and I need the strength of God. I want to strengthen myself in the Lord my God. Would you just stand to your feet right now where you're at? No one get up, no one leave during this time. Come on, let's not be rude to the Holy Spirit to the move that he wants to do in this place tonight. Look at this, people are getting up all over the place. You feel weak? Maybe you walked into this place and you said, I feel empty. God, I need you to fill me. Maybe tonight you came in depressed. You haven't got out of bed in days. Go ahead, stand up. God wants to heal you of depression. I, I think probably 80% of the room is standing right now. Some of you came in suicidal, ready to give up because you didn't have any strength left. People are still standing. My God. Those of you that are seated, would you just raise a hand towards these that are standing? Those of you that are standing, lift up your hands to heaven. Father, you see each and every need. You see each and every heart. God, you know the discouraged, the depressed, the suicidal. God, you know the lack and the want. Father, you know the pain and the emptiness. God, I pray that your spirit would sweep across this place right now. Fill every heart with yourself. God, you are the answer. You are the strength. God, you are the strength of our life and our portion forever. It is God who arms us with strength. And it's by our God that you train our hands for war, that we can take on a troop, we can leap over a wall. And so, Father, whatever obstacle is in our way, God, we declare it be removed in the name of Jesus by the strength and power of God. Whatever void is in the heart, God, we ask that you fill it with yourself. Whatever need or want there is, God, the desire, God, that you fulfill it by Christ Jesus. Lord, whatever heart needs direction and vision, God, I pray you speak a word right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father God, for lifting our heads, God. Lifted my eyes to the hills. Where does my strength come from? My strength comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Come on, let's just give a praise to the Lord. Let's just give a big, great big praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. He's worthy of. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Come on, let's talk. No one get up, no one leave during this time. Just need a couple more minutes of your attention. See, sometimes we in American church, we can be pretty foolish and think that just because people came to church that they're right with God, headed for heaven. But nothing could be further from the truth. You know that nowhere in the Bible say you sit in a church service and call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. And if you want to know why I'm so passionate about people getting up and walking out before church is done, it's because I know that not everyone that comes to church is a Christian. And I want to make sure that your heart is right with God and that if you died, you wouldn't end up in hell, but that you'd go to heaven. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, that's convenient but that's not safe. Why do I say that? Because hell is a very real place. And just by burying your head in the sand and saying, I don't believe it exists, doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to face the reality of hell. And if you're not right with God, God will let you choose with your life here on the earth where you're going to go, whether it be heaven or hell. God does not send people to hell. We choose with our life where we go. So I need your attention, I need your interest, because I want to make sure that you end up in heaven with God forever and ever, not go to hell. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. You know, you just stick to what you believe to be true, be true to yourself, whatever that means. 
And God sees that and he lets you in heaven. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere does God say you do your thing, I do my thing. You know, some people do whatever a well-meaning church committee says and that gets them right with God and headed for heaven denying hell. It doesn't work like that. Not all roads lead to heaven. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. You will never make it. In the same way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means there's one way to heaven. It's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. We've already seen you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It's like saying you can sit in the ocean, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. You're not going to make it. We've already seen you can't just ignore hell, and that gets you into heaven doesn't work like that. And you can't do whatever you want to do, so you've got to do what God says to do. Now, at this point, a lot of times people say, well, that's cool because I know that God lets good people into heaven. If you just do good, you'll get to go to heaven. But can I ask you a question? Can you show me in the Bible where it says you can be good enough to get into heaven? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible says just be good and God lets you into heaven. Nowhere is God weighing your good deeds and if they outweigh your bad deeds or if you were bad and you cleaned up your act, now you're good. Do you get to go to heaven? It doesn't work like that. In fact, if you read your Bible, you know that your goodness compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. If you want to go to heaven, the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. So you're not going to make it to heaven just by being good. Now, sometimes people say, but I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? You went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class, and you were baptized or Christian as a child. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere does it say your parents raise you in church, tell you you're a Christian that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or because you're born in America, that America is a Christian nation, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And I don't see anywhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God loves you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. If that's how you think you're going to get there, you're not going to make it. And let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I get that, but not only when I was a child that I go to church, I, I, you know, I, I got involved in my last church as an adult, you know, for a number of years I sang in the choir, I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader, I taught in the Bible class, even got a membership card, that's great, I'm glad you did those things, could you just show me that in the Bible where your church involvement gets you into heaven? It doesn't. Nowhere in the Bible say church involvement gets you to heaven. God is not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. You might be thinking, but I knew God. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know about Jesus and celebrate Christmas, sing the songs every year of my life, know about Easter and the resurrection. Come on now. I can quote Bible scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. Now, while that's great, I'm glad you can do those things. Just, just show that to me because you're in the Bible. But that gets you right with God headed for heaven because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say that because you know who God is, you can quote some scripture. Or because you celebrate a holiday that you get in heaven. In fact, if you read your Bible, you know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here for a second. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is in your head. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Jesus called it being born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals. This is not about what Hollywood and television and movies and books and blogs and the Internet say about being born again. This is about what the Bible says about being born again. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God? Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected, vomited from the body of Christ. So tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity. 
In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You might be. Let's push past that embarrassment for a moment. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe, friendly church service than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? Pfft, come on. You're not that dumb, but the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of this right now. Listen, you tell him to go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God. And listen, even if you are embarrassed, it's better than ending up in hell. Tonight, you don't have to go to hell. You can make your choice with your life to say, I want to give God all my heart, all my life. Be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. In fact, everybody around you is rooting for you. Hey, if you were brought by someone tonight, I'll let you in on the secret. They brought you here for this reason. Because they loved you enough to bring you to a church that would tell you about Jesus and give you this opportunity tonight. No one's judging. No one's criticizing. No one's condemning. We're accepting and we're loving you right now. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight and make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving them all of your heart and life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I describe it. You can get right with God in a moment. The count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go, all together, all across the auditorium back in the families wherever you're out watching my television in the foyer the love rock cafe and wherever you're at in the sound of my voice uh, even on the live stream you can raise your hand and then click the button respond to god on our home page or at the blue button right next to your browser and you can be led in a prayer right now count to three pop my hands together this is your time this is your moment of salvation here we go one two Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. Four, God bless you. Who else today? Four, five. Thank you. Over on this side, six, seven. God bless you. Who else? Who else? If I saw your hand, you can put it down. But if you say, I don't think you saw me, Pastor. Come on, just get it up for me. There's about seven wise people. Seven wise people. Where are you at, number eight? Come on, just pop it up high for me. Anybody else real quick? Thank you, number eight. God bless you. Who else tonight? Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Come on, just raise it up. I didn't embarrass them. It won't embarrass you. Come on, anybody else real quick. Number nine, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, come on. You should do this. Anybody else tonight? Come on, let's go for it. I'm going to wrap this up in a moment. But I want to give you one more opportunity. Thank you right there. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. Who else? Number 10. Don't you just feel number 10? Come on, number 10. You're just saying, I know I need to do this. Heart's pounding out of your chest. And God's just tugging at your heart right now. If that's you, God's, God's reading your mail right now. Okay? Just lift up your hand and say, yeah, that's me. I know I need to give God all my heart. I know I need to give God all my life. Come on, number 10. We'll wait for you. Where are you at? Just raise it up high when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Come on. Oh, number 10. Come on. We're all waiting on you. Okay, let's skip number 10. Number 11. You're sitting there and you're saying, I don't know who number 10 is, but God's speaking to me. Where are you at? Where are you at? Come on, just pop it up. Anybody else? Anybody else? God, I, I just can't give up on number 10. Number 10, come on now. You're just saying, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. We'll go back to number 11 in a moment. Number 10, come on. Just pop it up. Where are you at? I'm going to wrap this thing up. Thank you. Number 11. Number 11, now you feel better about number 10. So now you're saying, yeah, I can do it too. Where are you at? Where? Gotcha there, number 11. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 11 wise people. Now you say, Pastor, why are you so passionate about the people that left? Here's why. There would have been 25 more that would have responded if they hadn't all walked out the back door. Plain and simple. But they didn't give God the opportunity to speak into their lives. And that's why I appreciate you guys staying put. All, all 11 of you guys that raised your hand, or if you're number 12, 13, 14, 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap, give a shout. As we do, Elijah's going to lead us in a song. 
Do you hear that? Get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Once you get a friend, if you need a friend, get it in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do it till we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them from the foyer, from the bathrooms, from out there in the breezeways, from the courtyard, from the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, wherever you're at in here, from the family rooms, you can bring your kids. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. They're still coming. Come on. If your child raises their hand, bring them. They'll remember it. Come on now. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. You can come too. All right, I think they're still coming. If you need to come, you just come. Make your way to the front right now. God is so good. Hey, everybody up front. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing, okay? This is not a bad thing. Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. That's a blessing in your life, okay? I want you to look right over here to my right, your left. See this guy in the black coat? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, you go to church sometimes. You wonder, are they weird? You already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight. He's cool. He's going to do three things. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, and you're going to be born again, just like we talked about. Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff, a couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now that you're a Christian, what do I do? Hey, this literature, little pamphlet, easy reading, okay, will help you to find out what to do next. Thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer, or S. P-T. What is that? Well, it's basically a friend in church who will come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible, 15, 20 minutes before church service. Easy. It's free. You need to do it. He'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out in the church service, okay? Now, listen, listen. I'm going to make you guys a promise. Stick with us. Come consistently to church. Remember, we talked about strengthening ourselves in the Lord. That's what happens when you come to church, all right? You came here tonight looking for something. You found the power of of God. That doesn't happen by accident. That happens because you give some consistent effort. So I want to encourage you guys to come to church. Give us, you know, let's, let's do this for a year. Give us a year, okay? At the end of that year, consistently sitting under the teaching here at The Rock, I guarantee, okay, that you will say, my goodness, I am so blessed. I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Okay? There's the proof. All right? It all starts with five weeks with an SPT, okay? He'll tell you how it works, then I'll let you come right back out. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, 
please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.